Hello, and welcome to our second meeting with Mr. Strinacy, our principal. Mr. Strinacy, thank you for being here. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. I'm Brenda Posnanski. I'm the Director of School Counseling and Admission here at Bishop Girton, and we're so glad to bring some more information for, you, for all of you um, from Mr. Strinacy, who is going to answer our questions again. So, Mr. Strinacy, last time we spoke, you... Um, generally talked about schools that opened around the world, what we can do to help schools open safely, and touched on BG's planning for over the last few months. Can you share a bit more about where we are, um, about our planning specifically? Sure, I'll talk a little bit about the, the plan and some of the models we have in place. We're going with a color-coded model, and we have four versions of how school might operate at any given point in time. Um, a green model would be much like we became used to over the years, that when we get back to normal, we'll be in a green model where we might make some minor precautions, but for the most part, we'll be operating as usual. That's probably a ways off as we look at how circumstances are evolving around the country and around the world. Um, our yellow model is a, a very likely model that we may start with. Um, a yellow model would have all of our students in the building, but we would take a lot of precautions. Um, we would have screenings in place to make sure that as people come, they don't have symptoms or temperature. Um, we would expect masks to be worn throughout the school day. Um, we'd avoid large groups and assemblies. We'd be working uh, to have lunch in the classrooms rather than in the cafeteria, um, making some schedule adjustments to make sure our largest classes aren't in our smallest classrooms, th things of that sort. Um, to try to uh, minimize any risk that might exist for the this, this student body. So yellow model, we'd all be here, but we'd be taking some significant precautions. Um, our next model would be an orange model, a little bit more of a cautious model. This is also a possibility. Uh, we're trying to start the year with yellow, but, but certainly orange could happen at some point along the way. Um, and that would basically entail us reducing the number of students in the building, um, anywhere from a few fewer students to a majority of students at home. Um, and, a, and a small group of students at school based on the circumstances. So if we were to have a really significant spike in cases, we, we could set up a situation where students would be rotating in and out on, on a given day. Um, the important thing about this model, though, is because of our video conferencing systems and setups that we've installed in every classroom, a student who's not in class would still be receiving instruction that day, um, and they'd be participating in their classroom um, as normal. So. We would have a smaller cohort of students in the building, but the, the BG show would go on, the classes would, would happen as usual, um, and, and students would be, um, would be able to participate. In August, we're gonna be sending out some surveying as we try to assemble the cohorts. We're gonna to try to put these groups together in advance, um, and families would have the opportunity to say, well, if I might have a, a carpool with a particular student, and so I wanna make sure I'm in the same cohort as they are. Mm -hmm. So we'd have all that ready for the beginning of the year. When we arrange that, it doesn't mean we're going to that model right away, but we want to be able to make a call in the morning and say it's an orange day and group, group A is going to come into school and B, C, and D are going to be working from home and, and be able to switch to that smoothly. Uh, and then our red scenario is remote learning 2.0. Um, an improved version of what we did in the spring. Students mm -hmm. uh, attending their live classes according to a school schedule five days a week. Um, we've got some new tools and strategies in place. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this model because we want to try to avoid it. We know we can do it if we have to, but our emphasis is going to be on finding ways to be here in the building. Um, so finding the right shade of orange or yellow to, uh, to start the school year. And we really think that the flexibility of our orange and yellow plans should allow us to stay out of the red territory unless things get really bad in our area at some point. Yeah, so it sounds like it's very nimble. So can you uh, give us some highlights of the plan? Sure, well, a couple things. Um, one is just to build on something I said, no matter what model, no matter what color of the day we're operating, we are committed to providing live instruction to every student, every school day, based on what's happening in the physical classroom. And so the student's academic progress should be very consistent with what it normally would be. Um, we are looking at some adjustments we might make to our schedule to help facilitate this. Um, but unlike in the springtime, we would be meeting for the number of classes and the length of classes that uh, we would meet in our normal schedule. So the student wouldn't see a reduction in the number of class meetings. We think it's important to start the year in that way. Um, the springtime, we were ending the year. And so we could take it a little bit easier, but, mm -hmm. but we really want to start the year um, at our kind of highest intensity level and then back off later if we need to. 
Um, so the bottom line is no matter what format we're in, we're going to continue to offer a Bishop Garden education and continue to make sure our students move forward every day. Um, another highlight that we keep coming back to is as an independent school, we get to make our decisions independently uh, based on what's happening at BG with our students, with our families, in our immediate area, and what's best for our, our students. Uh, we have a lot of flexibility. We can change plans on a day-to-day -day basis with, with, with um, very little notice, and, and that's a huge opportunity that we have here. We get to make decisions that aren't being driven by, say, the needs of elementary school students um, or by considerations of schools in other parts of the state. We can really look at our own school community and making those choices. That really is a, an advantage for, for us as we move ahead. What about students and parents who are concerned about being in the building? Um, for themselves or the students being here? Is there any flexibility with that? Well, one of the things that the experts who, who really look into this and comment on this are, have been saying is that a reality today is that safety is not something we can assure anybody. That we always talk about school safety. That's not realistic in the time of COVID that we can be, ever be perfectly safe from an exposure to COVID, but we can work hard to reduce the risks that we face. Um, and so, you know, if you think about school, there, there have always been risks, right? You could, you could get in the car and get in a car accident on the way to school. Um, you could get sick with the flu or whatever's going around at the time. You could have an injury. You could, all those things are risks. Um, and, and interestingly, we also are in a time where not being in school has risks, too. We see that mental health issues have really spiked among teenagers mm -hmm. as a result of not being in the school in the springtime. So um, when, it, when it comes to mental well-being and development, we depend on being in schools for so many reasons that there are risks to not being here as well, and we, we need to be conscious of those things. Um, so when we're back in the building, we'd be lying if we said we could promise safety, but we can take steps to control risk. And, and that's an important piece of, of the decision making for us is how can we reduce the number of people in a space that might be exposed to something mm -hmm. if, there is, if there is a risk uh, involved. Um, but but uh, also with respect to some of our policies around masking and personal protective equipment and things like that. Um, I, I think our flexibility is going to pay us dividends. Um, we know there are ways away from solving the problem of COVID. Um, and so we're likely to see some spikes as we get into the colder mm -hmm. months. People get driven indoors and things of that sort. Um, there's been a lot of evidence that, that much younger students don't catch COVID or give off COVID at the same rate as older people. But... There's just been a big study in South Korea that shows older students, high school age students, um, are more susceptible to giving off COVID to members of their family if they mm -hmm. catch it. And so that gets back to our, our original concern that even if they don't get it sick, the teenagers can serve as a source of infection in the community. And so we need to be mindful of that, that we're not just protecting our students, but also their families, also vulnerable adults right. in, in the community. So flexibility is going to continue to be critical. It's just so much we don't know. Um, and I think that's important. Um, in our upcoming programs, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology that we're going to use. Um, one of the pieces that's important is that we be totally flexible, where we will make a decision based on our best assessment of the risk for the community. But every family has to make its own determination about risk. Mm -hmm. And for some, the family can't accept as much risk as the, the school community at large. And so we will support any family that wishes to engage in instruction remotely for a period of time, um, and we'll work individually to make that happen based on the video conferencing that mm -hmm. we've got installed in the classrooms. That's great. Can you tell us more about the mask expectations? Yeah, yeah so the M word is a four-letter word these days in some circles. Um, but over the weekend, uh, Dr. Redfield and the leadership at the CDC put out a really strong letter about masks and, and their importance. Um, there is increasing real evidence about the value of masks. Um, so the mask conversation is one that's happening at the national level. Um, some of our families may have even been involved in a big study at the Mass General Brigham uh, Hospital System down in Massachusetts. It has uh, tens of thousands of employees and they implemented a universal mask policy mm -hmm. pretty early on. And when they did that, they saw and were able to document a real decrease in, in the rate of infection mm -hmm. um, among their, their employees. Um, and that's in a hospital setting. So that, that suggests that, that this is a good direction to be in as a mm -hmm. school. Um, there was a recent survey or a recent study by Goldman Sachs that was released that says if we implemented masks, we could probably avoid a lockdown in the future as a society. 
um, that the equivalent uh, that there would be an equivalent uh, um, effect. Um, we've all heard the story of the hairstylists who mm -hmm. they got they got COVID, but they were wearing masks. Their customers were wearing masks, and and nobody else got sick. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the some of the anecdotes and also studies that are out there that we know that by wearing a mask we can really control if we get sick the, the risk that a person around us would would experience. Mm -hmm. um, jury is still out on how much the mask protects us. So we we as a school would be looking clearly at at some level of masking policy. Um, during the day that we'd be asking students and staff to wear masks. Um, we'd obviously try to find those places where we could have exceptions to that based on social distancing, but, but for the most part, students should expect that um, kind of in the day-to-day -day when they're around lots of people, they mm -hmm. would be wearing masks and teachers would be wearing masks as well. Mm -hmm. um, we think this is a big way for us to mitigate some of the risks of being here. Great, thank you. What are some of the key points that families need to know right now? Um, in mid-July, to prepare for the opening of school, sure. which is feels right around the corner. Sure. Well, first, uh, um, a lot of people have been asking about parking. That has been in the works. We've been trying to develop a scheme that's very flexible and advantageous to as many families as possible, given all the different models we could be operating under. So we're close, and that you should be hearing about more on soon. Um, secondly, schedules are out. Um, those are tentative. Those, those are subject to change, and everybody should be aware that as we develop and finalize our plans for the fall, we may make some adjustments to the schedule just to make things flow more smoothly, mm -hmm. uh, make sure we avoid the bigger classes. If we think we're going to be more orange than yellow at the beginning of the year, we may even make some adjustments to the, the timing of our schedule to make that process work better. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all possibilities. Um, third, and this one's really important, if you have travel outside of New England for the remainder of the summer, be aware that there's currently a 14-day quarantine period before um, a student could return to the classroom. So a family that's thinking of travel during the second or third week of August needs to be mindful of the fact that th that student may not be cleared to return until after the start of school. Um, so look at your data return to New Hampshire and add 14 days, and you, you want to clear that 14 days. Mm -hmm. That's not a BG policy. That's actually part of the state requirements for school reopening, mm -hmm. and so it's, it, it's not something that BG can um, really waive. That it's, it's very important that families abide by that. It also is something that could change. It could become more or less restrictive as the progress of COVID happens over right. the coming weeks. But it's important that you know, people do have trips planned, and it's important to know what the effect of those, those trips mm -hmm. would be. But like anybody else who would be quarantined, those students would have the opportunity to participate in remote instruction. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that we should be aware of as we move into um, starting of school? Well, just to reiterate the point about where do we spend our risk. Um, if, if it's important to us and to our society that we reopen schools, we need everybody's help. We need you to be mindful of where you are. Are you at lots of events where you have big indoor crowds with people not wearing masks? Are you being conscious of um, mitigating and minimizing that risk for yourself and your family? Um, th the most important thing for us getting back to a, a smooth start to the school year is to have our school community healthy going in. Um, and it's a full community decision and a full community commitment in order to make that happen. And we need your help in order for that to be um, where we are in the next couple of weeks. So just please be mindful of that going into the last uh, stretch here. Exactly. Well, thank you, Mr. Strinisty. Um, as always, this is so helpful, I think, for all of us um, of the BG community. And we will be filming our third part um, at the start of August, which Mr. Strinisty has told us will be more on the technology that we're going to be using in the classroom to help students have a full experience academically. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Have a nice day. Thanks a lot and have a great day.